In this video, we're going to look at the menstrual cycle and the associated hormones involved in menstruation. So first stage we're going to look at is the menstrual phase, and this phase is occurring in day zero to five of the menstrual cycle. This stage is specifically indicative of no fertilization. So this means that the corpus luteum has died because no egg has been fertilized and implanted, and the corpus luteum now forms the corpus albaceans. With the lack of this corpus luteum, that means that we're going to see a decrease in progesterone levels. So if the corpus luteum is now dead, the progesterone levels that it was secreting are going to fall, and we're going to see an increased release of SFH, and we're going to start to see sloughing of the striatum functionalis. So if we look at this pictorially, what's happening is we start to see the lack of the corpus luteum, or corpus luteum dies, which leads to the formation of the corpus albaceans, which is going to lead to a decrease in progesterone. And that decrease in progesterone is actually going to stimulate the hypothalamus to release GnRH, and the anterior pituitary gland to release FSH. So that GnRH also stimulates the release of FSH, and we start to see an increase in follicle-stimulating hormone. As FSH levels increase, it starts to stimulate the developing follicles. So we see a decrease in progesterone, leads to an increase in GnRH, and an increase in follicle-stimulating hormone, and this follicle-stimulating hormone starts to stimulate these follicles. And what that's going to do is allow these follicles to progress along their maturation. So we're going to see some follicles becoming primary or secondary follicles until one follicle will now become mature. So we'll see a maturation of one follicle. Again, it's important to remember that we generally only see one mature follicle at a time. These falling progesterone levels are also going to lead to sloughing of the striatum functionalis. So as progesterone levels fall, we actually see this layer of the striatum functionalis become sloughed off or the spiral arteries contract, leading to death of that tissue, which is going to cause the bleeding that we associate with menstruation. And we usually see around 100 to 150 milliliters of blood associated with the menstrual phase. To again support this through kind of a graphical representation, in the menstrual phase at age 0 to 5, what we're seeing is a decrease in progesterone levels. This falling progesterone level is actually going to lead to an increase in follicle-stimulating hormone. We know that's because the decrease in progesterone actually stimulates the release of follicle-stimulating hormone, and we're seeing an increased level of GnRH at this time. The next phase of the menstrual cycle that we're going to talk about is the pre-ovulatory phase. This phase is lasting between 6 and 13 days. We know it's going to end before day 14 because that is when ovulation is going to occur. So in the pre-ovulatory phase, like we mentioned before, one follicle has become mature and it is going to be the one that's going to release the egg. All others have become uh, supportive, but they're going to be secretory and they're going to release estrogen. So it's important to note that as these follicles are developing into secondary follicles or primary follicles, they do play a role of releasing estrogen to support that mature follicle. So as we start to see these increasing levels of estrogen, it's going to trigger a cascade of effects hormonally. Is increasing estrogen is going to lead to an increased level of luteinizing hormone, and this increase in estrogen is also going to cause engorgement of the striatum functionalis. These two things are going to help with ovulation, and it's also going to help support implantation if that's going to occur. So if we take a look at our drawing, we can see that these supporting follicles are going to release estrogen, which is going to stimulate the release of GnRH. So we start to see a massive increase in GnRH, which is going to lead to uh, luteinizing hormone release. And this release of estrogen alone is going to lead to luteinizing hormone. So it's the impact of these two hormones that are going to lead to an increase in luteinizing hormone release, which is going to help stimulate ovulation. Importantly, this phase also sees a decrease in the release of follicle-stimulating hormone. This may be counterintuitive as we know that estrogen is increasing the release of GnRH, but estrogen plays a role in decreasing FSH levels, and our supporting follicles are also going to play a role here by releasing inhibin. So these supporting follicles, as they're releasing estrogen, are also going to release inhibin, which decreases the release of follicle-stimulating hormone, which makes sense as we don't need the follicle-stimulating as we have a mature follicle now. We can represent the pre-ovulatory phase graphically as well, where we're going to see increasing levels of estrogen. So you can see by day 14, our estrogen levels are kind of hitting a peak, and this is going to stimulate the release of luteinizing hormone. During the pre-ovulatory phase, we also see this peak in inhibin, which is going to lead to a decrease in follicle-stimulating hormone. The next stage we're going to look at is the ovulation phase, which occurs at day 14. However, before talking about the hormonal changes, we should note that during the pre-ovulatory phase, our striatum functionalis was even further preparing for implantation of the egg. You can see the striatum was building itself up, and this is primarily related to the release of that estrogen. 
During ovulation, what we're going to see is luteinizing hormone levels spike. So we know the estrogen levels have been triggering this release in luteinizing hormones. And the spike at day 14, which is going to be consistent across all menstrual cycles as to when we're going to see ovulation, is going to lead to the release of prostaglandins and proteolytic enzymes. The combination of these two things is going to lead to the follicle to burst. And as a result, it's going to release its egg and we're going to have ovulation occurring. So as I mentioned, one other thing we're going to see is an increase in prostaglandins. So those prostaglandins are actually going to cause an increase in fluid and swelling within the follicle. And then we have proteolytic enzymes that are going to cause some lysis of the cell wall, which is going to ask, actually going to make it easier for it to burst and to release its egg. So the swelling and lysis causes the follicle to swell, burst, and then release the egg. Now that the egg has been released, we can finish off our graph and start talking about the transition from the ovulatory phase to the post-ovulatory phase. And this is where the corpus luteum is going to play a very important role. And as we see this graph finishing off, when we see those spikes at the end of the graph, that is because of the corpus luteum. So we know that the ovulatory phase is characterized by this peak in luteinizing hormone at day 14, so the levels start to increase during the pre-ovulatory phase and hit their peak at day 14, which is going to lead to the release of the egg. But all of these hormone levels that we see increasing, or the hormone levels of rising following that peak in luteinizing hormone, are due to the formation of the corpus luteum. So as that egg is released, the follicle wall remains, and in the post-ovulatory phase, that follic follicular wall is going to cause the formation of the corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum is going to release a number of different hormones, things like estrogen, progesterone, which is the main hormone we're going to see release at this time, relaxin, and inhibin. So we take a look at our corpus luteum and look at the hormones actually being released. We know we see relaxin, we have estrogens, we have progesterones, and we're going to see the release of inhibin, which is going to decrease the levels of follicle stimulating hormone and uh, luteinizing hormone that we see being released during this time. The release of the progesterone and estrogen together are going to lead to further formation of the striatum functionalis, which is going to lead to a better environment for the egg to implant. And the length of time in which this corpus luteum is going to survive is going to determine the typical length of cycle. So most females will have a typical cycle length and that's due to how long the corpus luteum will survive. Obviously that will lengthen if implantation occurs because the corpus luteum will then for survive for longer and is usually one of the first indications that pregnancy may be occurring. I just want to note a couple other things about the inhibitory hormones that are being released. When we get into this late stage, things like inhibin and progesterone are going to decrease the release of GnRH and LH and that's going to lead to further decrease of those more stimulatory hormones during the follicular phases of development.